you're not a true PlayStation gamer if you don't know Gran Turismo. Anyone who owns a PlayStation, no matter what the number, has a Gran Turismo game in their library. Because they're really high selling games, they get cheap so quickly, and I always wait until the games are worth peanuts. Look at my collection, most of them are platinum, and for good reason. At the time, no video game racer had more variety than Gran Turismo. In the mid 90s, racing games were about selecting a car and beating the others. No more. Creators of Gran Turismo decided to add what it's like to be a novice racer, looking to make it in the racing world by starting off with a cheap car, earn money, licenses, faster cars, and be the best racer. Even though all the games are rated G or E for everyone or 3, you get the idea. I think this was another example of PlayStation aiming at an adult audience. I can't really imagine a game like this being on the Nintendo 64, not just because of the cartridge size. And it wasn't until I was 12, 13 years old would I really comprehend how Gran Turismo mode works. Believe it or not, this game took 5 years to develop with only 7 people. It was one of the first gaming projects for the PlayStation when the console was released in 1995. But this team didn't meet a deadline. They developed something that they were satisfied with. No wonder we wait for a long time for a Gran Turismo game these days. Behold, the genesis of Gran Turismo. We'll start with what features it has to offer. There are 11 tracks, all fictional but fun, especially Grand Valley Speedway and Special Stage Route 5. 10 of 11 tracks can be raced in reverse. I can hardly think of any track in real life where you can race in reverse. Not that it's a complaint, the opposite actually, I think real life tracks should do that. They have some kind of mystical feel to them, especially with Grand Valley. The skyscrapers next to the track along with the canyon on the other side combined in one. Deep Forest Raceway lives up to its name. So many trees that branches get in the way. I can't think of tracks like these existing in real life. And obviously throughout the series, they continue to make them look more realistic. There doesn't seem to be that much in terms of safety for the spectator nor driver. Look at Trial Mountain. Go off the track and you slam right into a big rock. And would you feel safe in the stands with barriers like that? Imagine a tarmac road with such a steep angle. Autumn Ring. What, do they close the track when it's winter, spring, and summer? You can tell that the track designs, the U-turns, the chicanes, the high-speed corners, elevation, if safety wasn't a concern, these would qualify for real-life construction. Very well-designed circuits. The tracks also include real-life advertising on billboards and walls. Most, if not all, races back then had advertising that were fake, like Mario Kart with shots, for example. Oh no, this game uses real brand names, further adding to the realism making it one of the first games to do such a thing. Another thing that's licensed is the cars, 178 to be exact and are very well detailed on the track, although the back of the casing says there are over 290 cars. I don't know what to believe, they must have put race modify optional cars into the equation. They all have their own individual stats which makes gamers have to think about what they select or purchase, especially with the first car, just like <clears throat> real life. Manufacturers include Toyota, Nissan, Mitsubishi, Chevrolet, Aston Martin and many more. Okay, so you have the variety, licensed cars and brands, but how does it fare when you're actually racing? All I can say is, it's really good. The steering does take some time to get used to. Going too fast around the corner and braking too hard causes you to either understeer or oversteer. I know it's easier said than done, but you really do need a lot of practice, especially if you're not used to racing in PlayStation 1 games. But if you're using a PlayStation 3 controller like I am, use R2 to accelerate, L2 to brake, and the analog stick to steer. Trust me, it's a lot of fun. It just feels... old school. However, if you are playing this on the PS3 and you're using analog control, for some reason, every time you start a new event, it switches back to digital mode. Nitpicky I know, but it's pretty tedious having to pause it and change every single time I race in a new event. Also, catch up or rubber banding is evident. 
Look, I pass everyone on the straight right at the beginning, but they keep up the rest of the race. I know this is on PS1, but when I began reviewing this, I didn't expect this game to have catch up. I hate that in races. It just makes things unbalanced. There's no damage model in this game, so if you hit a wall or another car, there's no damage to your own car or the performance. That's pretty realistic, right? Maybe that's how I should drive on a racetrack from now on. Once you do finish a race, you have the option to check out the replays, which back in the day was radical. You can even save the replays if there are any true highlights. As you can see in this review, there were a few. Looking at the graphics now, they're obviously outdated, which is usually the case with most games in the 5th generation. Which reinforces my point that gameplay and control are the most important things in a video game. But that small pixelated look, there's something about it that I really can't explain. Somehow it just adds to the charm. There are some attention to detail moments, like in the stands if you're doing a license test, they're completely empty, but in a race, they're filled with people. If you try to play it like an arcade machine, you know, pick a car and track and just race, it can do that solidly, but race to win because you have only four tracks available. In order to unlock a set of new tracks, you need to win in single race. See, now there are new tracks. The game speed increases and the elevations sharpen up on the tracks which give the cars some air. Notice the difference? The controls are a little bit different on the arcade mode. It feels sharper and touchy, more plastic. But no racing game should leave out split screen multiplayer. Hey! I mean, it's no Mario Kart or Crash Team Racing, but it's still pretty enjoyable. Overall, it has a surprisingly compact arcade mode. But the game is advertised as the real driving simulator, therefore Gran Turismo mode is the party piece. It feels like an arcade racer armed to the teeth with cars and customization. Actually, just give me a second, I have to obtain my license. Possibly the worst part of the game because it's boring and it doesn't really help my driving skills that much. What good does driving in a straight line do? You have to drive like a maniac to survive! See what I mean? But it's a racing simulator and it's pretty likely in real life you need a license to race, so I give them credit for that. The presentation. Look at the menus, the fonts, the shaping, imagery, shortcut icons. It's right in your face. Straightforward, simplistic, no nonsense, but at the same time, not lazy. I assume it has to do with the fact that the game is Japanese and having menus and fonts like these makes changing the languages easier. Think about that for a second. It has 17 race events. The number of licenses you obtain determine which event you're allowed to enter. There's time trial which is used for car testing and spot race for novice racers to earn skill and credits. I wouldn't bother personally. Then there are the GT events. No limits, whatever you want, though I recommend fast as possible. There are also special events where there are championships based on endurance, drive type or non-modified cars which adds variety and strategy. Each event is a championship, all with a string of races on a calendar. Winning the race earns you credits. Winning the championship gives you a bigger amount, just like <clears throat> real life. You even get credits for gaining pole position in a race. Despite this, I wouldn't bother because most of the time you pass everyone at the start line. Stupid catch up. You'll have to race in the Sunday Cup a few times before you can afford another car you want as well as upgrades including the engine, tyres and suspension to name a few. I saved up to get a purple Nissan Skyline GTR. Did more races and tuned it so much its tits might have popped out. Yeah, I selected the purple Skyline GTR because the earliest memory I recall of playing a PlayStation 1 Gran Turismo game is driving a purple car on arcade mode. It was a really long time ago. Anyway, I won the Clubman Cup numerous times so I had enough to get a 500,000 credit car. Yeah, I bet anyone who played this seeing a 500,000 credit price car for the first time would have felt really keen to take it for a spin. It feels oh so satisfying when you finally have the money and buy one. Once you get to the stages that require those cars, you really have to buckle up and get your racer's senses working, especially with international A licensed races. You certainly need to be patient in this game, even though there aren't as many events as there are in the latest successes. It takes a couple of hours to really get going. 
but the gameplay and controls are solid enough to motivate you to win all the events, meaning that playing this game is worthwhile. If I had to choose between this and Gran Turismo 2, I would pick the latter, because it has everything in this game, and more. I'm not going to rate this game based on the rest of the series, but when the game was new in 1998. I give Gran Turismo 9 out of 10. You had to own a license, get a cheap car at the start, win races, earn money to get parts and buy faster cars to be the best in the world of racing. In 3D, on a home console. That's a lot for a game that came out in 1998. It's actually a very revolutionary game and set the base on how to make a good racing simulator. Today, there have been so many Gran Turismo games as well as other races released over the years, which makes this one more simplistic and nothing more than a novelty. But that also adds to the enjoyment of this game. It sold nearly 11 million copies, making it the best-selling PlayStation game, so you won't have to look hard or spend too much dough to get a copy. It's certainly worth purchasing, an excellent racer. So let me ask a reasonable question, Sony. Why in God's name is this, along with the rest of the series, not available on the PlayStation Store? They better do it once Gran Turismo Sport comes out. Don't forget to check out other reviews, subscribe, and like Color Shed on Facebook. The links to subscribe and like are below.